Hey everybody, AmpRepairGuy.com, 203-892-4119. So, people have been waiting for a video on the AK Ultra, so I figured I'd do one real quick today. So I'm not working on it, I'm not taking part, I'm not doing anything to it yet. I'm super busy with other stuff. So, this didn't come in for repair, this is a different story, so um, it's more of a side thing. Work, regular work is, you know, first comes first, and the uh, multi band thing will be completed before I get into this thing. So, um, I'm going to go over my thoughts on this. I had one of these years ago, an early version one, or I should say earlier version one, like this one is, and uh, I went through it, did all the revisions to it, used it for a while to make sure it worked, and then I got rid of it. You know, these amplifiers were really designed for people who are going to just park them in one spot. It's not really a good amplifier for ham radio use. It wasn't built for ham radio use, where it goes from band to band, where you're constantly adjusting it when you're going to different bands. Roller inductors really aren't great for that purpose. It's better to have a band switch, you know, like a rotary switch, preferably a progressively shorting one, you know, variable cap for the C1, variable cap for the C2, fixed coils, you know, some people could say, oh, you could change the Q, you know, with a variable inductor, yeah, you could do that, but variable inductors, roller indu as known as roller inductors, require a lot of maintenance, and a lot of people don't do the maintenance, so they end up with issues, and also, you're not supposed to tune a roller inductor under any sort of load, maybe a slight, which is like a teeny bit, but a lot of people forget, and then they end up trying to adjust it. The contact could be dirty, it arcs, pits, just gets progressively worse. So, in this amplifier, it's a unique setup. They tried to obviously make it cover, covered 160 through 10. Uh, there were some gaps, I guess, where they weren't supposed to use it. Uh, probably due to, you know, possible, I guess, uh, guessing plate choke issues and uh, just the way the circuit's designed. But it has a pile network, output network, and instead of having just one coil and two variable caps, or it'd be two coils and two variable caps, they actually switch in fixed capacitors on the C1 and the C2 side. So, they use these flapper things to progressively uh, add in capacitance as you went down in frequency. So, yeah, it's just a uh, different way of doing things. Now they made an amplifier called the Fork Hill, which that was probably the best amp in my opinion that they ever made. That had a variable inductor, a 15 amp, I believe it was a 15 amp inductor, yeah 15 amp with 8877, but it had a variable cap on the C1 and the C2. Um, and a, kind of a strange input circuit. So everything tracked along with each other with the chain drives. So they do use a variable cap on the load side. 500 puff uh, max capacitance so you can fine tune the output network of the amp to the load impedance your antenna load but uh, okay so I'm going to point out problems that I've seen over the years that I've encountered with these so if you end up with an open on the output a lot of times it ends up flashing between the C1 caps and the chassis. These are voltage skyrockets. There's a screw. It's hard to see, but these capacitors, these doorknob caps, are mounted to a piece of, it's called uh, Microy. Uh, it's made by a company called Christex Composites. So there's a screw. There's not much of a gap between the material and the chassis. So if the RF voltage skyrocketed, 
it would flash and a lot of times the micro material gets damaged. And I've seen where these flappers don't make perfect connection with the contact underneath. And then the output network's thrown way out of whack. Or a flapper disengages. It's actually missing one. These are controlled solenoids. They're pulled down. They don't always go straight down. They can be at an angle. The adjacent contact contact could uh, either not make connection or it's a poor connection. So so adds them in on the C1 and the C2 side. The tube's obviously not in here. He uses a 36 3000. Chimney's not in here, obviously, or the anode connection. So he told me someone. I haven't really looked at this that great. Someone disconnected the. There's another one over here, flapper type thing that shorts out half of the. L1 coil. And yeah, it's all uh, boogered up. So these originally came with a one piece plate choke. Like I said, it's had some revision. They've had revisions over the their lifespan when they were making them. And uh, they swapped that out for this two section style. I don't know that. I don't even know if that's correct. Someone may have put it in there. I'd have to check the wire gauge and the amount of turns. But someone definitely changed the, the output vacuum relay. Uh, I think that's a Russian one, I believe. And, you know, this is obviously an earlier one, like I said. The later ones have a piece RG393 going from the output uh, common connection up to the output connector. It's like the safety choke has had some heating. They also upgraded the strap width and the way they um, secure it all. Like I have one on my website, <coughs> the one I actually did all the revisions to. So if you have an older one, you can actually refer to those pictures for the uh, the updates. Um, you know, the old versus new. So they tried putting a piece of Teflon underneath the newer ones to stop that arc issue, but it would still happen. A lot of times when it would arc, it would actually blow the, the doorknob cap would blow apart. And I got a bag of blown up doorknob caps <laughs> along with the amplifier. So there's some sort of goo, like a clear goo on the the uh, tubing, like the inductor material on the inside. So I don't know what that's about. But the problem is... This one has a lot of pitting on the shaft that the wheel rides on. You can see some of it there. This thing's had a hard life. So, yes, yeah, so I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I mean, I'd have to take this inductor out, have it rebuilt. I don't know what the condition of the tubing is but the shaft is definitely shot the wheels prop the roller wheels probably shot these parts are made at Henry radio so they're it's not like I can just go buy one you know I probably have to see if Contronic labs can help me out again they helped me out with the last one uh, looks like someone took the edge wound inductor out at some point because there's a screw missing you can see down there mounting screw So, these are just a few little things that I've seen, like that I that I see just off the bat. You know, I haven't taken the RF deck out. I wouldn't be surprised if the unin, back-to-back unin, whatever circuit they have for the makeshift input circuit isn't bypassed. I'm willing to bet that probably by that's probably. You know, a lot of times people they they overdrive them. You know, they see AK Ultra, they think it's AK output. No, that's the input power. This is rated for, I think it was like, I'm going to have the main alert here. 2,500 watts DC nominal, 5 kilowatts PP. So, 
you know, that's its output. So people, they just push things, beat, beat on things, they just, all sorts of crazy stuff. So, um, so, uh, they end up saturating the cores for those onion things. And, um, I had one come in one time. Uh, I actually talked to Ted. He gave me the guy's info who actually designed it. That guy tried to make me one and it still didn't work. He must have used the wrong core material. But, uh, yeah, so if that shot, a lot of times people, they just bypass it and hook the the capacitor right up to the, the cathode you know, the filament. So, and they just eliminate the input circuit. But then you, you know, your harmonic suppression isn't as great because the, I mean, that input's not the greatest to begin with. It doesn't simulate the flywheel effect. So it doesn't really give much, If any, I don't know if it gives any harmonic, helps with any harmonic suppression, but bypassing it, I'm sure, I'm sure it does something at least. I've never put one on a spectrum analyzer, so I can't tell. Um, for sure, but um, I'm sure it does at least something, you know, so um, Anyway, yeah, so I haven't seen the bottom, but so I don't know why someone took the solenoid out um, And uh, I don't know what happened uh, caused the other one over here to fail yeah, So it's like it's missing pieces and Yeah, there was some arcing and something bad happened back here you can see there, there's a lot of uh, residue on the back wall <coughs> so yeah I'd hate to strip it but you know there's a limit to what makes sense you know if there were something I wanted to keep it'd be a different story but as for resale nah it's just you know again this this really isn't a great amp for multi-band use you know, I have a Rockwell Collins auto tune amp and I have the um, 160 through 15 meter amplifier that just totally blows this thing away. People could say, oh yeah, it's neat. It has the remote you put on your, you know, your desk, you know, near your radio and you put it in the other room. Yeah, that's fine and dandy and all, but these things are a constant headache. So I'm going to have to think about it. You know, I'll pull the RF deck out at some point. Um, Another revision they at some point over the years they they added a third fuse holder because they have a low voltage supply in there that's on all the time. Part of the control circuit to turn it on and off. And the capacitors would fail and then actually the guy sent me a picture. I don't know if it's still in here, but the, the supply I haven't opened the inside of it yet. So the supply would melt down and that's a fire hazard. So they put a their fuse holder in like those ones right there. So if that happened, it would just pop the fuse. So that's that. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah, Henry was notorious for. Move this over here. Holes. Like, see, they had like. To get screws to fit. Do it in long gate holes. <laughs> That's the cover for the arc deck. So. I don't know. I might strip this thing and then put a regular output network in here and reuse the servo motors and everything. You know, put a C1 cap over here, C2 cap over there, and do something different with it. And you know, I like amps and all, but you know, it might be a neat project, but. Again, I have no interest. This is something I think, more than I think about it, it's more something with all of the, with what's involved with it. Might it's, it's feeling like it's something which is not worth doing. It'd be more of a labor of love and sorry I got enough stuff going on. So please don't ask for parts. I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to do yet. I haven't torn it all the way down like I said so you know once I know for sure then I'll make a decision but yeah so I don't ever recommend buying one of these a lot of them that I've seen have been severely abused and I don't 
I don't even work on them anymore for people. It's just not worth it. Just require too much, too much work, too much, uh, too much extra labor. You know, figuring out how to get things made and and uh, and or rebuilt or whatever. You know, so anything can be fixed, but. There's really a limit, so if you have one and it works, I guess if you just baby it, you take care of the inductors, and uh, you just want to have it to say you have it, but these are these are worth a lot more than they're really worth. I don't even know what they sell for nowadays, but... So another issue I want to point out is, you know, they have uh, a resonant choke type set up for the uh, plate supply and they use uh, 20k 100 watt resistors I have to look at the schematic I forget if it's four or five of them but they're in series and I believe off the top of my head I think the transformer has a I think it's 6,000 volts AC before it's rectified so if one of those resistors opens up which I've seen happen the, D, the DC voltage skyrockets. So if that happens in, in your transmitting at the same time, that's another, another situation where it can flash. It has a spark gap in there, but <laughs> it still flashes between the, the caps and the chassis. You know, so again, just a not a great setup. This is a situation where they sure they designed it. There were, two, I think, two different guys that, you know, there was one guy that designed it, another guy that redesigned it, and added all the revisions and all that, and, you know, putting an amplifier into a dummy load versus, you know, perfect load, and parking it on one band are completely different than factoring in mistakes people make with their load, you know, their antenna, you know, open coax, or something wrong with their feed point you know, uh, you know, and then changing bands and not taking care of the inductors so but, you know if you could get these inductors and all these parts you know that's a different story but you know Contronic Lab inductor will not fit in here you know so yeah, the newer ones I think had uh, that uh, red material. Yeah, they didn't use this stuff either. And they actually put a bead of silicone down. And they had these tabs secure to the coil. I'm guessing it would maybe vibrate or something. I don't know. Like, uh, who knows? So, well, thanks for watching. It is Sunday. I'm gonna get back to doing some other stuff, but I wanted I wanted to throw a video up real quick. So I'm gonna think about it long and hard, but yeah, I don't know. So so thanks for watching. Website is ampreparguy.com. 203-892-4119 and. The other website is harbachelectronics.com. I've been shipping a lot of kits. I guess there are a lot of people working on amplifiers this fall. So keep them coming. I get stuff out within a business day. And uh, thank you for all the support with that. So take care. 73.